Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm ready for a weekend. Oh, me too. <laughs> yep. Um, so he, he's joining us and he's got some other people joining us that he's invited who he's going to talk to. Is that how it's working? I'm just introducing him. Yeah, as far as I know, yes. But I mean, I think he's trying to engage a discussion. So okay. I mean, my question, so I'm going to make him, I'm going to just try something with you really quick. All right. So never mind. So uh, yeah, I'm just waiting for him to show up. We have 40 people who bought tickets. More than that, we just sold one 20 seconds ago. Betsy, we're gonna have to figure out the money we have to give to Teach for, teach for uh, Design for America. Yep. I think we just come up with a reasonable sum and give it to them and call it done. Uh, so I guess I could go through all the Tickets we sold to all the different to all the like okay, all the he's different. Here. Can I let him in? Yeah, please let him in. Okay. Hi. Hi. Hey nice to meet you. You too. Thanks this for having me. This is Betsy Bardell, without whom I'm nothing. <laughs> That's a bit she's, of a stretch. She's, but... she's she's what makes Design Observer possible. Just the gift that keeps on giving. Well, it's lovely Thanks to meet you. Also, people yeah. like you are because um, that's right. Uh, because Nitan, without without support, we are just the two of us sort of sitting around trying to twiddle our thumbs and figure out what people want to do next. <laughs> so, we totally appreciate you doing this today. I'm really excited about it. No, me too. Me too. Thank you for all of the emails and uh, interest and engaging with fairness in all of the, all all of its ambiguity and. Um, yeah, thank you. I am going to introduce you, uh, say a little bit about what I think you do, which is the tip of the iceberg, and uh, the hour is yours. Perfect. Uh, we have, let's see, what, 40 people coming? Uh, more than that, looks like about, about 50, 50 plus. Um, uh, I have made you the co-host, so yeah, you're welcome to thank you. admit whoever you would like to. Um, I, for some reason, it looks like I did not make everyone be on mute when they joined. So we might want to, when we introduce, when we let everyone in, we might want to hit mute all and then unmute a few of us. Um, the only reason if people like shuffle their coffee cups, all of a sudden they become the speaker <laughs> view, you know? So yeah. um, I usually set that up correctly and didn't. So <laughs> it's the holidays and COVID yeah, and a I'm million sure. things I can blame it on. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. I'm, yeah. I'm actually flying after this. This was a little unplanned. So I'm flying tonight. So I'm also like a little... Where are you going? My head is in different places. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Where are you off to? I'm going to see family in Israel. Oh, awesome. Yes, yeah, so it's a trip. long flight. You'll... So... Yeah. How, how many hours? 12 hours. And how long will you stay? Three weeks. Yes, it's a, it's a big one. Are there any restrictions? Do you have to do any quarantining on either side? Yeah, or? yeah, there's a lot of auxiliary forms and stuff yeah, yeah. that need to happen. Um, yeah, but I figured, to go, I figured now would be a good time to go, you know, between semesters, everyone is like a little lag, you know, more relaxed. Mm -hmm. and because the time difference is a real to seven hours, so. Yeah, yep. Should I let people in? I think we're 12 Friday. Hey, Bizon. It's Jessica and Betsy. Hi. Hello, hello. What? You are in a beautiful place. Where are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm in San Francisco, so it really depends on how you feel about the city. But well, you're I, wearing a t-shirt, and we've got two feet of snow where I am. So yeah. I'm already yeah. jealous. Whoever you are, I'm already jealous of you. <laughs> okay. I think our weather is, is uh, a little warmer than yours. Yeah, let's let people uh, in. Yeah, let's yeah, let people let in, people and in. I'll keep an eye on that part, um, and let keep admitting people. So, um, hi guys. Oh, how exciting! Look at all these people. Ah, Leslie, I didn't recognize you with your name. <laughs> Using my partner's go. computer, my computer's on the fritz. Thanks.
Wonderful. Okay. Still coming in. People still coming in. All right. Someone just emailed me that they don't have the link. So I'm just going to send her the link real quick. Okay. We're going to get started. People I think are still coming in. Um, I'm Jessica Helfen. I'm one of the founders of Design Observer. Uh, we are opening this Design Observer Cooperative Community session on to uh, the public. We've had a big uh, resounding level of interest in the people we'll be speaking today and you'll be speaking with them. Um, Nitsan Herman, before I introduce you, let me just introduce Betsy Vardell who's gonna wave in the upper left of your screen. She's our executive producer. Um, the other person who gets a shout out is Emma Steinhobel. Emma, wave to everybody. Emma is our favorite student. Uh, she's come to every single one of these sessions we've done since the beginning. Uh, so she has a very special place in our heart and um, talented young designer if anybody's hiring. So um, there she is and she will let you know how to reach her. Um, we've got about an hour together and the person who'll be guiding today's conversation is our new friend Nitsan Herman, who is an innovation consultant, writer, coach, who is deeply passionate about communication in its many forms. Uh, in his practice, he helps companies break down silos of creativity. He talks about technological innovation, R&D, and how we shift the conversation from what he calls communities to circles. Uh, in his latest project, MetaMedium, he's been researching, is currently researching the psychology of creativity, digital habits, and solitude. And one of the many things he's going to speak to us today is about something he calls thirdness. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce my new friend, Nitsan, who's going to take it away. Thank you and welcome. He's also getting on a plane in a few hours to take a very long trip to Israel. So um, we're really glad he could make the time to talk to us today. Nitsan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I start, I just want to introduce a couple of people in my orbit that are in the space with us today. So um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of these projects later, but Pizod and Leslie are uh, collaborators in uh, Critical Business Salons, um, which is the next evolution of Thirdness. And also I'm seeing that Todd Berger and Sasha are here who are part of Thirdness. All of those things would make more sense in a minute. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, try a new way of, I guess, presenting or um, just talking through some of this work. So I'm just gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna do this nifty thing you can do now where you can share two windows at the same time. So, hi. So, hi everyone. So, I am I'm from Israel, as um, was alluded earlier. Lived in London for for a number of years. I've been here for ten years. I've had jobs um, in media companies, and then I started uh, my own practice. And one of the projects that I did in my own practice was an innovation a project with MoMA, with a great shop called Co Collective which was very interesting and, uh, and amazing and all the rest of it. At the end of that project, I felt um, something new that I didn't feel before, which was that I had a, I like to say fire in my belly that I didn't know what to do with. So in other words, I had all of these ideas. I spent all this time with innovation consultants, business strategists, museum curators, clients, you know, all of those folks. And I just kind of, I knew that I'd, I, I created something that couldn't, that I had to put somewhere. So what I did is I, uh, I guess intuitively, um, just started this self-initiated research project, which was basically nothing more than me writing an email um, once a week for the entire year. And uh, that ended up being a really powerful meta moment for me because this idea of going out of what, um, what the world is asking from you independently and building IP um, and then waiting in that place for people to 
to come close to what you're doing um, has been a pattern and something that I've been doing ever since. And as uh, Jessica mentioned, this year, finishing very soon, I'll, I'll finish another exercise um, on the psychology of creativity and solitude. Uh, and really what I do is I just, I just every week I just write something and if it's good, I, I, if I think it's good at least, I make it into a blog post. And then if it's, you know, if that stays with me, then it might become an essay. And sometimes projects happen as well. And the project that came from MetaMedium is thirdness. So next to all of this work that I've been doing, I also organized things like uh, salons in this village where I invited, you know, philosophers and, and researchers and scientists um, to talk about certain topics and their research and their work digital archaeology, post-phenomenology, emotional connect connection to objects. And that slowly morphed into dinners and a bunch of other things. And, and I felt like there was something more that I could do. And the, the experiment basically took shape as, what if I asked a group of people to pay a nominal amount of money in exchange for a social contract? Um, and that's how, that's how um, thirdness came to be. Initially, it was called uh, Community 2020, and then I started calling it Meta Community, and then I realized, you know, hold on, intuitively there are things happening here that I don't see in other spaces. There are things that are, are unique, um, specifically things like showing up as a process and not as a product. So if you think about, just to kind of start contextualizing this, if you think about any of the communities that we, we take part in and think about a designer community um, or any of the dozens of slacks I'm sure we're all part of, you know, you go into a space, um, you might be invited into a designer space and within that space, you're probably only able to show up as a designer and you're probably only gonna be talking about designery things, right? Now, I'm not saying that that's the case in all communities, but that's definitely the inertia. The inertia is for us to go into a space, introduce ourselves in the context of what the space is expecting, look for fit, and in a way productize ourselves. And that's that's one thing that I was uh, very intentionally trying to, to move away with um, with thirdness. And the name actually comes, there's there's a lot more here, which I'm sure we'll weave into, into, um, into the conversation. But the, actually the name comes from the idea in psychology of the analytic third. And the concept of the analytic third is that uh, when two people show up in a way that's maybe more process oriented and not um, product oriented. So in other words, I'm not only a designer, I might also be a DJ, or I might also be a writer, or I might also be interested in linguistics. So all of those different things. Um, I um Sorry, I'm letting people in as I'm talking, so I'm going to stop doing that. Um, when people show up in process, there is one, the other, and then there's the um, third material that gets created that's independent and contextual to both of them. So in other words, that really shuffles the way we think about collaboration and communication, because if I just post a link in this Zoom, for example, it's uh, it's not only that we we look into the broadcasting of that of that link in and of itself being a contained an item that we can't open. It's also the way it's received. So um, I like to say that in the shift from communities to circles, one of the things that we do is that we don't necessarily look for a median culture, but we have a mesh of furnaces between the individuals. Um, some of the other differences um, are that we, we're starting to get less transactional and maybe more transformational and transformative. Um, and, and also that the space tells us what it needs. So I like to say when I invite people to fairness, I, I really just kind of say what my intention is, but the space really tells me what, what it needs. Um, so I know all of that was maybe a little uh, abstract and I hope that for conversation, we can, uh, we can flash that out a little more. Um, I invite um, 
people in the group that have a part of this initiatives um, to jump in if there's anything that I, I left out. Um, and we're just gonna gonna see where um, yeah what comes up I guess. Um, Bizod, Leslie, um, Sasha, Todd, if you if you feel like um, I missed anything, uh, feel free to jump yeah. in. I was gonna say that the one thing that I think you probably just have encoded into your behavior at this point is the way that you discourage people from identifying and sort of leading with artifacts or outputs as a part of the coming into the space. And so in, in these, you know, even now, we don't really know who each other is. And so we have this kind of infinite canvas by which we can engage. We haven't oriented anyone else to how we should be engaging with each other. And I think part of that opens up for that mesh of thirdness because we now get to just bring in whatever we want into this space and invite others to engage on that axis, not titles, historical affiliations, et cetera, et cetera, that would predefine what the access of engagement would be. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. So I guess one thing that's really interesting is that in the moment when we go from our head to the world, I think that that's a moment where we lose a lot, like we, we lose a lot of affordances. In other words, as soon as the moment we start introducing ourselves and make assumptions on what the environment expects from us is the moment that we start funneling the range of creative discourse we might have with the other. So, and, and that has, I mean, if you're being critical about tools, I mean, I also closed um, in fairness, I closed Slack and, uh, you know, there's, you know, Slack or Discord operate on a broadcast mentality masked behind a promise of transparency. But when a space asks and delivers on co-creation, transparency is no longer an issue. And broadcasting becomes a hindrance to the ecology of communication. So one cartoonish way I like to talk about all of this is that many online spaces are probably, you know, people kind of exchange cucumbers, right? Like I'll give you a job lead, you'll give me a link, you know, those kind of things. Like, you know, you, it's a finished thing. Like you can't do anything with it. Where I think what I'm talking about here in all of those spaces is, is much more tending to this co-creation, this ecology of, of communication. So it's really tending to the soil um, in, in a way. Um, and, you know, I also like to say that we do a lot of uh, learning together, but learning different things. So the same way that if you go on a hike, you know, everyone might get, um, you know, inspiration from different things, but we are on the same kind of physical, physical hike. And there are ways of, of encoding it into the actual week in, week out uh, discourse. Um, for example, I mean, do we really need um, to index all of the all of the knowledge and all of the links that we generate as a community? I don't know. That's a question. Um, Another thing I'd add is that there isn't a reductive outcome. Oftentimes, when we hop on on these calls and in COVID times, we have clients and we have an outcome that we need to arrive at. But the, the composting and like the nurturing of that soil is really the, the objective of everything as opposed to by the end of this call, we need to have this strategy or we need to have these designs approved. And so I found it to be a place where my brain was breathing for the first time in, in COVID because I, before I was just so stuck in this two dimensional box, ch checking off a bunch of boxes where this is a place that felt a lot more, we use the word organic, but a place for your, your brain to breathe and permission to entertain and engage ideas without having uh, a transactional kind of cucumber outcome. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, thank you. And a lot of it also comes from the, from the fact that, you know, we don't really have a lot of affordances for, for um, random exchanges right now. I mean, if you think about the fact that we all have to, um, you know, between scheduling Zoom meetings to setting agendas to having slide, like there's, it's all very, um, very planned. It's all very planned. And I, I, I don't know, for me right now, I'm, I'm feeling um, 
like the only way we in COVID, in the COVID reality to, in, to increase the range of creativity we allow ourselves in conversation, we should really, um, we, you know, leaning into, into communication and synchronous communication at that uh, feels like the lowest hanging fruit. I would love to, I mean, these ideas are, bet, are best used when uh, discussed. So I'd love to just have a, have a conversation. Um, so guys, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in with any, any comments, questions. I have a question. Yeah. I'm, I'm old, I'm probably the oldest person on this phone call. Um, and uh, so it's very interesting to me. I, I love hearing uh, Leslie's uh, comment about the hope Feel, I'm feeling the sensing a lot of sort of hope in this comment. But I, I'm wondering about the kind of bias people bring to conversation. You know, the bring your whole self to work idea, which is a beautiful, hopeful thing. Also, the, the sort of underbelly of that is that people have bias. People have existing preconceptions about what they see, what they hear, what's on a Zoom, what's on your face. And I actually thought quite about it a, a bit about this when I was writing my book on the face because I realized that we all bring to, when you bring your whole self to work, you bring bias with it, whether you like it or not. And I was reminded as you were talking, Nitsan, that um, I once heard a psychiatrist say that there are four people in every relationship. There's me, there's you, there's what I think of you, and there's what you think of me, right? So I'm wondering how thirdness helps us understand each other as much as it helps us be hopeful about ourselves. Yeah, beautiful. Um... I would argue that we all have creative surplus. And if we don't try and, and address it, find it, seek it, hold it, mash it, then it just ends up um, in unhealthy places like professional resentment, like maybe a non-constructive, unsafe um, discourse of the type you know, you're talking about. Um, you know, I mean, again, and I'm speaking from experience, I was this guy with conviction I couldn't explain, right? So conviction you can't explain is probably the fastest indicator to a, to a creative surplus that is not, um, that has not had the space to be understood. I, I was actually gonna bring up the same, the, the four people comment, I, I think, one of the things that's been helpful in at least the salons and, and in this model is that you aren't presenting that shell or there, there isn't the, the projection that other people are invited to engage in until you contribute something. So we're all sitting here and until I say something, you have no idea what I do or where I came from or what's going on outside of whatever you're seeing here. And so in the same way that we get flattened into these you know, rectangles, there's also this flattening of like, we all just chose to show up here. And that's really the only bias that we can bring. Like we all must have heard about this somehow and are connected or interested in having this conversation. And so that's almost a re like the, you have less of an invitation to engage with my bias because those biases are hidden. And hopefully there's an opportunity for me through this conversation to maybe not present or reduce or eliminate or confront them because you're engaging with the ideas and with me, not the projection of my bias that you would be seeing otherwise. I, it's a, that's super interesting. Uh, I also want to say, I also want to say that I'm, I'm, I think we're all just trying to kind of you know, move around with these ideas. And I'm internally grateful for everyone that's uh, flying on this plane that I'm, I'm building while flying. It's all very experimental. Um, I, I think there is a way, Jessica, to your point, definitely that those ideas, if integrated, could make for, you know, um, I mean, discourse in and of itself is, is an act of active thinking. And whenever you do active thinking, you know, people might might take it in different ways, right? It's not the tidiest thing to do. Um, but I I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's a way that I'm trying for that, that discourse to happen in a safe way. And I like saying that 
in those spaces, we create just sufficient amount of misunderstanding between people. So then be, within that space of misunderstanding and differences, value gets created. In other words, if I'm just going as, with a, as a designer to a designer's, designer space, then um, the profession of design is not really benefiting as much as it could. Because- um, You're saying if you're not broadening the discourse, you're just speaking in the lexicon of that small world. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I, I think the nature of transactional relationships, and <clears throat> I'm assuming most of us spend most of our days in largely transactional relationships, uh, those of us that create more free time and space for ourselves perhaps don't, but that the nature of transactional relationships is such that they require some degree of bias, or at least a certain degree of bias is expected. Like if I'm showing up in a designer artist capacity, the person on the other side of the dialogue is expecting certain biases. My my aesthetic sensibilities, my organizational sensibilities, my worldview, there's, there's an assumed bias. But when you enter into a non-deterministic, clearly generative space, which is what Nitzen's created with thirdness, uh, the notions of those biases are, are broken down because there's no clear objective. So I think everyone knows it's safe to come to the table with any sort of perspective, not necessarily the perspective that one would think is perceived of a more transactional relationship, if that makes sense. Does that make sense, Nitsen, to you as it really Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with that. I mean, there is also... And it's nice not to feel like you have to bring your biases. I know I'm, I'm, I'm bringing my bias to most of my conversations all day long purposefully but you know uh because they define who i am i'm, I'm using biases largely positively in this context um but it's nice to enter a place where you know you feel like you don't need to do that and and not only do you not need to do that but there's an opportunity to let your guard down and uh, perhaps reveal more loose peripheral thinking that doesn't come with a clear bias. It's um, Barry, how are you? Hi. I just want to throw a question out. I'm sorry, not part of the group or not, not a designer either, but just listening in and knowing it's um, uh, um, the, the notion of the third space, you know, when you, when we've been talking about it a little bit in our conversations, you know, I, I, I haven't understood exactly where it, coming from and i think hearing you talk about it now i have one place where it's rooted but what i've sort of realized uh, coming into this call is that for me there's a whole nother area that i don't know if you're referencing in it which is this notion of a kind of hybrid co-creation of meaning um or an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary space which i think is how the third space has been used at least in some other context and I was just curious if that's part of what's behind it or or am I adding that into the mix in a, in a, in a way that you hadn't thought of <clears throat> no it's super it's super interesting I mean one thing that's coming up to me is that there's a lot of relational creativity that also happens here you know you could say that the analytic fraud is just you know it's not only it's it, it, it's very much the space between us holds certain type of creativity so, and, and by that, we could then incorporate that into, so for example, Barry, if we were to talk about, you know, anthropology, for example, obviously I'll, I'll hear certain things and you'll hear certain things that I'll talk about mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. And both of those things would exist outside of us and it will be up for us to incorporate it into, integrate that into our practices. So mm -hmm. I guess what I'm doing here through all of this space, spaces and experimentation is building a different modality for lifelong learning, which is very much self-driven. So it's driven by the self and by our, by our interests. So, um, yeah, but I would say it, it's very much, I, I, I agree with what you said, sure. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea of relational, relational creativity is, um, is part of that. Um, 
Yeah. Well, in the multidisciplinary context of the group, from designer, developer, strategist, theorist, healthcare technologist, uh, attorney, et cetera, right? Um, I don't know that we have an attorney in the group per se, but I was, I was sort of stretching the spectrum. There's a lot of value in thinking in between all those disciplines and there's an opportunity to extract ideas and approaches that one can apply to their own that you don't necessarily see when you live in your own world of creative discourse. Uh, and speaking for myself, I'm, I'm mostly in the design contemporary art world and that discourse while broad is still limited in, in scope. So when you pull people outside that sphere in, it opens up your thinking to, to going to new places. And, and Nitsen, you didn't mention non-deterministic or, or generative, but I know you and I talk about those two ideas a lot outside of the group. And I think those are two key premises that are kind of foundational to what's happening in thirdness. You, you said them without using those words. I don't know if you wanna elaborate on, on those two ideas and how they relate. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, just to bring all of this right into like our daily Zoom routine, I mean, how many spaces do we sit in where we can be in silence, for example, in Zoom? I would, I, I think that's a really good litmus test for how, how open the space is. Um, yeah, and I mean, really, when we meet, we have absolutely no goal. I mean, in, I think you can say, uh, how much air I'm allowing this space to have, right? I'm not, I'm not sitting here with decks and really going full slide by slide. And it's a little uncomfortable and that's the point. The point is to be okay with it and just kind of let it, let it be. And um, I, I will say having spent a lot of time, there's an innovation logic underlying all of this. Having spent a lot of time in AI, you know, it's very clear that the cost of producing products is diminishing. So anything that's kind of known and structured is slowly making its way into an automated space. So, so the idea of amassing knowledge, producing more and more products, I think that, that island is slowly, the, the sea is rising on that island. You have to keep climbing higher on that, on that up, up that, that land. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to do is really in those spaces, focus much more on the questions we're asking as opposed to the, to the answers to those questions. I was thinking maybe we can do a, a quick breakout room. Betsy, can I create breakout rooms, do you think? Is Nissan Sorry, talking? I was on mute. Um, I, if, um, sure, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Um, we haven't done that before, but you're more than welcome to, um, uh, I, we probably should have done it before, but we haven't so far um, had an opportunity to. So uh, if you want to do that, if you want to see if it'll work, um, please uh, do. I don't and... think I, so. I don't think we have it enabled. So I'm oh, sorry, okay. guys, for that for the false build. Up. Can I can I enable it now? No, or, not that would work. Okay, never mind. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. But thanks to to that question on um, you yeah, know deterministic. I guess, I guess I would, you know, the question I was thinking about posing in the breakout rooms and I, because I would love to get a lot of these things, as you can see, just come from conversation. So the, the thing I would, I would have everyone maybe, maybe just reflect on is how many spaces are you a part of that allow either for, um, you know, showing up in different ways or allowing you to not introduce yourself and, and just maybe spaces where, where, you know, value gets created and not only aggregated. I find that a lot of spaces, you know, and I'm specifically talking about the, the slew of Slack teams or communities or, you know, things like that, where really it's more of a switchboard. You know, it's more of that cucumber metaphor as opposed to really growing value. And, and I find that as soon as, you know, you start seeing overlaps in those, in those Slack teams, um, you start seeing people cross posting. It just kind of, it feels, um, it feels draining. I mean, in a very real talking about our feelings kind of way, where I think what I'm trying to do here is, is build spaces where, um, you know, filled with radiators as opposed to drains. 
I guess. Guys, I would really love in the, um, I would really love for people to jump in. I, I'm seeing this chat, so feel free to unmute and. Um, yeah, I'd also add is in a, in a moment of contraction, a lot of the world is unknown and, and in fear, I've watched a large percentage of people and, and corporations go back to a core and insular perspective. And if this is a game of musical chairs, the, the chairs at the edges for those who see interdisciplinary or, or push out into new spaces, uh, the music has died down, but we've all found each other, at least I feel through thirdness, because these new ideas and new solutions are exactly in my estimation and many of ours estimation, what will get us to the next state of consciousness as a, as a humanity, as well as solutions to some of these really big, huge challenges that we're facing globally and geopolitically and, and environmentally. And so it's been a refreshing space to have that permission to think more expansively because reductively we're having to show up and, and just do this. Like we, nothing new, you know, don't, don't teach me anything. I just need to do this one thing. I've watched a lot of kind of myopic sessions um, kind of devolve into let's just not push on any boundaries in a way that um, is very counter to, I think all of our creative um, juices, but certainly now more than ever, we need to keep nurturing that and keep honoring that part of ourselves. And that, that kind of creative surplus, if not used or not tapped into or not found communally a place to, to thrive, um, certainly can go underutilized and underutilized creativity means the things that need solving um, will, will not be cracked. Those codes will not be cracked. And so I, I do appreciate also that in a time of every, every other call, again, use, is reductive, is, is contracting. This is a space that still has um, expansive potential and, and a permission to do so. Yeah, Leslie, okay. that's cool and well said. And I think in times of uncertainty, and all times are uncertain to some degree, but right now there's a particularly high degree of uncertainty. Playing and engaging in, in spaces without boundaries, at least for me, feels like it helps to create new types of resilience and uh, for expansive creativity and just resilient thinking, adaptive resilient thinking in general when you enter into these, these spaces like, like the thirdness space and you can play in an unconstrained, unbounded, exploratory manner, there's a sort of sense of resiliency that, that comes with being in a space like that because it's kind of the antithesis of, a lot of us are probably reaching for various control mechanisms right now given uh, what the near-term future looks like. So to let go and, uh, expand and explore feels super valuable and to do it again doing that safely and and feeling comfortable maybe maybe thanks by the way guys i love all those um uh, thanks for listening to us. you know one thing that actually i'm realizing is very relevant to circling around this point is that i don't know there's a to me there's a very 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 big difference between creativity and production and i think that's another version of what we're talking about in other words, do we really, can we look at our day and, and kind of see what we do and, and separate what's truly creative than what is, what is production and what, you know, there's a, there's a sense of, there's a sense of navigating the unknown and, in, in, you know, and I guess what I'm saying, I find that design has really been useful for me through COVID is what I'm saying. So design as the way that I see design in its thoughtfulness and in its ability to, to go into, into the fog and, and in, in, enroll other people has been, um, this version of design is, has been incredibly energizing uh, in dealing with the unknown. And I guess in, in, in all of these activities, I'm trying to, to super boost everyone's, you know, the people that would come on this ride and try and super boost their own, um, you know, practice, I guess, and integrate it into their practice. 
would love to hear an example from Leslie or Todd or Nitsan of an actual thing that happened, a thing you made or saw, or not production, but a mistake, uh, a discovery, uh, an unveiling of some new thing that that you could share it by way of example. Is, is somebody have an example? I, I have one. Um, yeah, Jessica, thanks. Uh, so well, to Nitsan's previous point, right, I know uh, when I'm in production mode, very little new original creative thought is happening because I'm in production mode. The idea has already been formulated and now I'm producing, right? So my larger breakthrough or the ideas that feel good to me happen when I'm not designing, when I'm not consulting, when I'm not engaging in a predefined creative conversation. It happens in the in-between spaces, right? And then the production happens later. Um, and I have a lot of constraints around my work, but I, by and large, they're born of this more non-deterministic, looser, sort of ethereal feeling. And so I, I've personally sought spaces. And when I'm in solitude, when I'm seeking solitude, I often try to go into a, a sort of non-deterministic mode and just be open to the universe, if you will. But uh, as it relates to that, that idea of non-determinism and, and some inf inspiration that I took from the group was uh, particularly due to COVID, I, I work with a partner. I've had the same design art partner for almost 20 years and, and we're separated and largely isolated and our, we're not spending much time in our two studios. So we wanted to come up with a new body of work to move forward that we could work on uh, independently, but collaboratively. So we devised a new premise of, of paintings <laughs> that we're calling units where we're looking at the canvas and in some cases wood panels and other aluminum as, as the medium for the unit. And we're making a large volume of monochromatic works in a fixed dimension with no intended assembly. So it's, it's by and large a non-deterministic painting practice where we're just painting monochrome objects at scale literally stacking them up and then we're assembling them collaboratively after in various ways, stacking them, detaching them, spreading them out. Uh, but we're not going into the making of the work with any preconceived notion other than we're painting a large volume of monochrome things, if that, if that makes sense. And sort of that exploration was born of COVID, but was also born of thirdness and was born of this idea of like, using our creativity and our skills in a more non-deterministic way, that's also generative because after we make all the units, we then assemble them and we make something new. And so it's sort of didactic and very simple, but it's one way in which we've been exploring some of these ideas. Does, does that, is that- sort Yeah, and do you think you wouldn't have gotten to that without this uh, larger I, conversation I, I mean, about thirdness? I, I, think, I think that was COVID inspired, but thirdness, uh, maybe made it feel safer and more open and uh, help develop that premise. And so now we're taking that non-deterministic generative thinking into other projects we're currently working on with clients for ourselves and trying to figure out how to harness it more because I think there's a lot of opportunity and magic that happens when you go into projects with some constraints, but lots of like, fluidity and openness around the periphery to see where they may go. And, and coming back to a couple notes I made on transactional relationships, right? I know that's a hard thing for clients and partners and sometimes collaborators, collaborators to embrace. Like everyone wants to move down the funnel as you're working on a project, right? Start broad, narrow the constraints, get to the goals, get to the things, give us the assets, like, okay, we're done, right? So so how do you move down like a creative funnel with constraints that are being refined as you go down the funnel, but when you get to the point where the thing would be done or the work would be done or the project would be over, then you open the funnel and you go back out to a new space. Now we did all this stuff, but how do we reassemble it, recontextualize it, look at it in a different way? Um, so yeah, it's again, per biases, I'm sure I was bringing some of this thinking it happening internally and bringing some of it to the group. But I know that through engagement with the group, it's helped, uh, it's personally helped me feel better. And then like 
you know, sort of pitch this idea to my partner and for him to embrace it and us to collaborate on it together. And, and now it's growing and evolving and like moving in new ways. Um, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just add, you know, I, I don't really see us, um, I mean, the, the, you know, the idea is, is Todd's just on that example. So really what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is really the same way that anyone that joins these groups, you know, the ideas are there, the creative surplus is there. I'm just there to take them out on a hike or to, you know, to curve out the space, to act on that intentionality. You know, it's a, there's a bit of an um, artist designer, maybe, maybe dichotomy that's flowing through all of this. Maybe, you know, it's basically like, how can we open the suitcase of our creativity and repackage it in a different way? Like that's, that's maybe one version of, of um, saying that. I was, think, I was thinking maybe in the absence of breakout rooms, maybe we can just um, open the, you know, the conversation. I'd love to hear maybe if anyone, A, what just what's coming up for people, but B, also, um, you know, maybe there are certain digital habits that, uh, that um, you know, under this new, you know, conversation we just had for the last 40 minutes, there are any, any digital habits or spaces and that feel like you feel like you you can do what we talked about or can't do what we talked about or have any any comments or provocations around it um can i can i talk about my experience um i'm mujan so i'm um now in manchester in uk I'm planner by background and I work with designers for the past three, four years. And it hasn't been the, the easiest collaboration because of these biases that um, was there. And what I find a bit uncomfortable is um, the emphasis on not having a bias because that's impossible. You, can, you have a, a, a frame of mind um, based on your career, based on your uh, cultural background, based on your experiences. So I feel like, um, why not feel comfortable with that frame? And once you know your frame very well, then you can see how you're interpreting other people's frame. And I feel that's the way more productive way of collaboration because uh, for a long time, I was called, oh, the boring planner among designers. And then I was like, oh, maybe I am. Let's just see whether they're right about me. And I might not, not know myself as a planner. And I have some judgments about the designers. So it took me a, th a good three years to really understand frames, to understand how I'm seeing these things. So I, I think I feel a bit uncomfortable about why we are so uncomfortable about biases and frames they can be very productive and they can be very exciting to discover. I, uh, I completely agree. I mean, I would say just the way I heard in maybe in some of the terms that we talked about uh, here, you know, there's a sense where we need to integrate those different parts of ourselves, including the creative surplus. And there is a way that we should have the capacity to not to, to, to not only use um, the professional identity that our surrounding gives us. So a version of that might be a job title, right? So people tell you what you can or can't do, right? And you might need to negotiate that with your own you know, creativity that, that you have. And, and I, would, I would say maybe to, so that's one, one thing I would say. The other thing I would say, and the reason obviously that we have to think about biases today is, you know, all the way from AI bias or workplace bias or unsafe work environment. And I think a lot of that comes because people are operating based on the scripts that are told to them, right? So say I'm an engineer, I'm, I'm only thinking about this artifact. I'm not thinking about the process. I guess we should talk about artifact and process because that was the title of the talk. Um, but, uh, um, you know, when we just produce, right? So that's the creativity to production. When we just, when we just produce, we, you know, we think linearly, we think input, output, I'm making these things, you know, I passed it on to someone else, right? And, and 
there's uh, the inertia is against the thoughtfulness that I think we're talking about when it comes to actually self-authoring, integrating, thinking about about what you're actually interested in, and navigating those spaces with the respect of the other, with respect of the other, which is which is difficult because you know it requires communication, which is one of the things that is a big part of what CBS is meant to do, the critical business salons, is um, allow people to to discover and articulate the creative surplus as a mean to, to be better communicators. So I think that's why it's all kind of surrounding around communication, right? If, if I'm using someone else's words to describe what I do or wh who I am or what I'm interested in or what I just, or the reason for what, for the decision I just made, that's gonna, that, that might, that would only go so far. If I'm unable to rewrite the language I use to describe mm -hmm. my solutions and my ideas and, and the things that drive me, which it, in essence mean that I'm not tapping into my creative surplus, uh, that's gonna limit. Um, and that's gonna cause dissonances and the interpersonal uh, conflicts, maybe of the kind you said. Um, I'd like to jump in here uh, if I can. This is Jennifer, I'll be a voice. Um, what you were saying, Musan, and then uh, Nitsan, um, it's very interesting about the framing and it makes me think of how introducing the idea of play is, is, can be very important here, sort of shape shifting, going back and forth between artifact and process, because maybe akin to what you were saying, Musan, is I very much enjoy framing the frame. I very much enjoy playing inside the frame and playing actually inside artifact and looking at language for what I describe, how I describe myself, how I made my own frame. It's a lifelong work. And then sort of, you know, toggling into the process and shape shifting. And anybody who's ever been uh, a part of or very sensitive to, you know, uh, queer, uh, culture group, subaltern, non-dominant group, a non-privileged group um, is very is it gets very good at shape shifting and gets very good at having to do a type of of theater of, of going back and forth through different um, identities. So the practice that that um, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very stimulated by what I'm hearing here in my my brief contact with Nitsan has sort of been sort of a wonderful explosion is um it is a lot about how we lose how we use language the geography of language you know and 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 space and intentionally in our own language and it's like what something that deleuze said or wrote in some of his works we can have one foot inside the text and one foot outside of the text um and there's there's very there's much playfulness there and so I think that's where I, I will leave this is to introduce this idea, you know, of what we're talking about of going back and forth from the artifacts and the processes. If we introduce play into this, maybe as a notion, maybe as a concept, as a language, as 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 creating shared meaning with each other, pl playfulness. Hmm, how, what does that do? I mean, there's also a sense where everything we're talking about is a bit of a call for design philosophy. But not in the not in the Foucault, you know, Latour, you know, it's um, you know because what I think what we I guess the outcome to Jessica's earlier question, the outcome is uh, is context. So the outcome is context, and I I, I would argue that um, it's called the meta community because rather than being in practice, because everyone speaks different language. Right, so we try and go one above, and then we can re leave this space with new context, new ways of looking at things. So maybe, you know, I mean, we've, I'm sure we've, we've all had it, like where you sit in front of a brief and you really come up with something that connects very disparate things. So Kostler, Arthur Kostler used to talk, you know, wrote about this a lot. Like what, how many dimensions go into your idea um, and it, it's that engine that connecting different ideas keep growing as opposed to acting on this one thing you did. Uh, I guess I'm trying to, in, in all of those things, and I think what we're all kind of circling around in, you know, in words are very difficult to describe all of this. Um, 
is really, again, trying to put words on thoughtful creativity um, and reinventing oneself and self-expression. I mean, I think that's really what's kind of, what's, what I'm, you know, and again, I'm selfish in this pursuit because I uh, get very antsy very quickly when I sit in one space very long, uh, you know, too long. So, so this is, this feels so interesting because in many ways it's, it's a new version of research and coaching and design and philosophy and critical thinking and all of those things kind of mashed together. And I would argue that any time that a strategist will tell you that they're being a little bit of a coach to that CEO in a business or whatever, you know, they're doing a bit of this as well. So, um, yeah, that's just some, some thoughts that came to mind. I don't know if it's worth me saying a couple of words. First of all, I'd, I'd like to say to Jessica, she's not the oldest person in the room. Uh, yeah. Secondly, uh, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the beauty of uh, what's happened, and I've been on several of these Design Observer uh, occasions going some time back now, is access. Uh, I found COVID has given me access as I look across these screens now to people all across the world, including a friend now in Manchester, which is brilliant because I know it very well, having been born on the Wirral. I live in a very unique place, which is uh, the Channel Islands in Jersey in the Channel Islands. So we have um, 100,000 inhabitants on this island. And uh, my previous role and, and creating a framework and a bias is that I was a politician and a senior politician in our own government. So I was the education minister. And I brought to the table just before I left uh, design thinking and creative thinking and notions of thinking differently. And it was like in many of the meetings, I was an astronaut that walked into the room. They really couldn't get their heads around it. And the notion of walking in with any kind of concept of abstraction, as opposed to that notion that Todd was talking about, where you're working down the funnel uh, and heading towards a conclusion, because that's what everybody wants from a politician. Here's the problem, go away and solve it and come back with the, the solution. Was the beauty of using, and I'm not a designer, as I've already said, but loving the concept of design thinking in particular, was that I was able to take people into that new thing. I, as I look across this little room now, you're all explorers. And the thing that will happen through COVID, from my perspective, is that people are looking for people like you to lead them out of this situation. We've got everybody else covering all the bets all around the world, and we've got vaccinations happening, and, and the whole thing is reaching a, a different level now. But what they're desperate for is how to make sense of what happens in the future. And it's those people who start step into what Nitsan was talking about. And I've written some notes down here. I love the idea of actually not creating biases and, and uh, walking into a room and say, it's very difficult in this island because everybody knows your business. Um, <laughs> but that uh, idea of actually being able to say for the first moment, we can all have that creative space, third space, whatever you want to call it. And there are no bets on the table. And actually what we're looking for is a sense of creating a, a cartography of creativity so that we can begin to apply some of the passions that you all uh, have um, related. And I'd say to Muzan that, you, you know, it strikes me sitting here, you've, you've turned up at the meeting, you become part of it, you know, and what you will take away from it is to be inspired to actually take this to other people. It's that infection rate, a different sort of infection rate uh, of creativity that to me is the most charming and the most exciting and inspiring element that comes out of meetings like this. So first of all, it's access, but also the notion that we can spread this sort of not a gospel, but a consideration. When I've had meetings and introduced design or, or creativity, there is a, a breathtaking moment where everybody lapses back to what you were talking about at the very beginning. That's the bias, that's the concept. We, you know, we'll put you to one side because you don't belong in our world. And then bit by bit, as you keep passionately, uh, uh, resiliently and tenaciously uh, and stoically putting it back on the table and saying, you've got to pay attention to this stuff because this is the future they start to get excited about it themselves. And that's that's what our raison d'etre is, is to make sure that we do infect those people with the kind of the very thing you're doing. So every meeting I've attended of these design observers has left me with a bunch of notes of, of people that are really passionate about what they want to do. And I've walked away thinking, here's another set of ideas. I would like to see one of these at least every week, I have to say. And I'm Aww. a bit this has been a bit disappointed with the numbers because previously we've had higher numbers. But I think it's, again, it's that confusion uh, and that fear 
people have about the the sort of high level of discussions you've been having about abstractions and the sort you know uh, we've kind of got to break through that we've got to find a simpler way of uh, attracting so lots of what you said here today is is really uh, sat with me and, and i'll take a lot away from this thank you well thank you for uh, yeah thank you beautiful articulation as well and i would say that infection thing you're talking about that's what I think Todd uh, and we use a lot the generative idea, you know, the fish versus give, giving someone a fish versus teaching them to fish. That's very much, I think, what we're talking about here, that uh, when you produce something, either for a collaborator, friend, colleague, client, you know, you give them that artifact. But when you meet in process, then you, to some extent, you teach them to fish because you're able to show up in process. So the concept of showing up is also very, very important. You know, obviously that needs to be done with, with a safe environment and biases to maybe to this tension that we talked about earlier, you know, biases need to be, um, I wouldn't say control, but there needs to be a, some sort of sense of safety for sure. There needs to be a sense of safety. Um, and and I guess on a, on a cultural level, I would say that we do a lot of product uh, producing right now and we don't do enough of open generous meet me at my studio kind of yeah. thing you know even i mean can we even explain what our studio looks like you know your mental studio you know we're all in covid right now like you know we're sitting here in front of computers and, and phones and all that but can we describe the different rooms and compartments in our in our um you know in the attic in our mind so to speak um so I think this this kind of self reflection is is in the in the core is the core of what I'm talking about. Um, out of out of a belief that in complexity that there's a lot of of emergence hiding in plain sight if we do do that. Oh, well, if I can just sort of reply to that a little bit, I mean, what you've inspired me to do today is something that's been a consideration in my mind. So the island I live on is broken up into twelve parishes. So they have these little communities within the community. Uh, and I think that notion of creating the third space and creating game, I mean, it's, it's about saying there is a meeting here, please turn up and let's begin the conversation. And then not putting a shape on the conversation until you're into that meeting. And particularly, I like the idea of not having sort of biases and titles and things. Um, because it's that sort of sense of inspiring. It doesn't take a great deal. Uh, and once you get it, it, every meeting I've attended where we sort of set that as some sort of agenda uh, where you're saying, you know, you can design your future, you can design your lives, you can design anything that you like, and it doesn't matter about your job title. I mean, that was one of the first sort of uh, things that came back to me when I had a meeting years ago was a guy saying to me, you've taken away my job title and you've made me a designer. And I, like I say, I'm not a designer, but I was there to say, come on, what can we do about these situations that we find ourselves in? So that's why I think you guys have really got a, a job <laughs> a job to do. As, as, as an older person is kind of, you know, handing on the baton I'm saying you've got there is it's exciting it's really exciting the amount of creativity I've seen coming out of COVID has been phenomenal and it doesn't get talked about and I think it's it's uh so going back to what I was saying at the beginning I think it's about I'll, I'll be starting creating some meetings where there isn't any big agendas but, but there are concepts around the sort of things you've been talking about and what can we do about it and the minute you go back to that notion of infection they they pick it up and the way they run with it um, I, I have one more quick example, Jessica, that's kind of tangible and it hits on what <clears throat> Jennifer brought up about process and artifact. And uh, it's not directly thirdness inspired, but we've been pursuing it sort of since COVID and, it, and thirdness has informed it further. But our, our typical process in working with clients is a, a lot of upfront thinking. We go away, we do all our work, and then we present it very cohesively, very thoughtfully, create all the context, right? Uh, uh, with a lot of our more advanced design buyers and people in the art space, we're working now in a super loose manner where we're literally integrating them into the process and we're showing them everything we're doing throughout the day as it's happening by just screenshotting and dropping things in Slack with little bits of context, which is super risky as a designer because you could show something that's a little fucked up and the client could glom onto it. And then you've got to like back your way out of that thing that they like that isn't done yet. But you know, the only folks we can do it with, we have to, we have to set up the premise. Like, look, this has to be a super trusting safe space. We're going to show you everything we're doing. If that's how you want to play, 
and it's not all going to be to totally baked and, and, and some of it's going to get thrown out. And so you just got to be ready to let it come in and sit with it. And then we check in at the end of the day and uh, review those ideas and we throw out what's bad. And sometimes we have to, you know, talk someone out of something because it was, it was too loose. And then we take what's good and we move forward. But we've been building a, a lot of trust and creating a much richer context uh, on the projects that we're working on like that, which has been really interesting. And like nine, 10 months ago, a year ago, I would never consider working like that. It would have just seemed too risky and too loose and uh, too uncertain. It's a beautiful example, and it seems counterintuitive for me to ask Nitsan to wrap up now because we're at, we're at 1.30 uh, here on the East Coast um, because it has really been a marvelous conversation. I'm so grateful to all of you. Rod, your inspiring comments about your world uh, that is so far away from our world and yet apparently so close uh, was lovely. And um, I'm just so delighted so many of you have come from around the world to share your um, thoughts and opinions and experiences. And I'm sorry, it's the last one of the year, but uh, we are wrapping up the year. We'll be doing it again, I hope in January, particularly given all this enthusiasm. And I wonder if Nitsan, you could like to have some closing comments. Thank you. Thanks guys for holding space in this uh, little, um, you know, through these ideas. Um, I would say moving forward into 21, um, I'm gonna launch critical business salons every week on Friday um, where spaces like this uh, would happen weekly um, for an hour. So there's more information in that link. And if I can, if you have any questions, I'm putting my email in the chat as well. And thanks for having me, Jessica and Betsy. Thank you so much. Delighted. Everybody have a wonderful, safe holiday and um, we'll speak to you in the new year. Thanks again. Merry Christmas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Goodbye. All right.